Hey everyone, welcome to the Happen Films podcast. This week we're speaking to Jono Fru. Jono coaches farmers as they transition to regenerative farming practices, and he co-founded a discussion group that is making huge change in the New Zealand farming scene. And his own journey of moving from conventional farming and chemical spray application to a regenerative model is really inspiring. And he has some great stories to tell about the changes that he's seeing on the ground with farmers in the community. We hope you enjoy the episode. Jono, thanks so much for joining us today on the podcast. We're super excited to chat with you. We've, um, yeah, we've known you for a, about a year now that we, after uh, we went to a talk where you were speaking and we're kind of blown away by um, all the stories you had coming out of the regenerative, regenerative ag world um, mm. that you've been involved in. So, um, yeah, super excited to chat. And we're wondering if you could, um, if you could begin by just sharing a bit about what you do. What is it you do kind of on the ground as a, would you call yourself a regenerative ag consultant? Yeah, sure. Okay, and yes, so thanks for having me on the show. Um, Yeah, has it been a year, guys? Wow. Um, Yeah, so what I do is I am, yeah, I call myself a regenerative agriculture uh, coach and and a big picture coach. So, it's um consultant's been a word that i've sort of wanted to avoid um right from the onset because i don't want to be known as the guy that tells people what to do i'd much rather be the guys that the guy that's known for educating and enabling farmers to be responsible without relying on others to be telling them what to do and how to operate so i'm always sort of interested on how you word that you know and i don't think consultants a word so i've landed on coach and what I do is I go around um, teaching farmers, I guess, ecological principles and functions um, based on the regenerative agriculture principles such that they can then look at how that might apply to them on their farms and then go about creating systems for themselves with my guidance at first, of course, um, that suit them and their own, you know, very unique uh, circumstances, which, um, you know, of all the farmers I deal with, there's never one or two, sorry, the same. Um, so teaching them the, the, the principles and the functions so that they, they can then get a bit creative in, in, in doing their own thing that's specific to their interests rather than, you know, taking on a generic approach like what we've, you know, been used to in the regenerative, and so, sorry, in the conventional space. Yeah, so like getting to your personal story, were you, have you always been a farmer and, and what's that sort of journey in, as in, the, in the world of farming been for you? Yeah, okay. So, um, no, uh, so I've always been a farmer. Um, I started farming when I was 11 years old. I got my first paid gig at 11. And um, for me, it was like, man, this is it. You know, like this was this was what I'd waited my whole life for, well, all of 11 years. Um, because school wasn't it for me. You know, school sort of didn't cater to my interest and my learning style. And that was apparent in my, you know, in my behavior and and the the various letters sent home about my behavior and things so um when i when i discovered farming it was like wow this is it you know i was able to be creative i was able to be adventurous and and the physical aspect of it all it just it just you know that was it and so um i've been farming most of my life um where i haven't been farming i've been um I've been a, a chemical agronomist and a chemical applicator um, and, and a fertilizer agronomist. So very much the other end of the spectrum I'm now on. Can you take us back in your story of um, what what being a conventional farmer was like and how many years did you do that for? And yeah, what was it like living that life? Yeah. Okay. So I, 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 I farmed conventionally for sort of 11 or 12 years before doing the, the chemical agronomy thing. And look, I was really good at it. It was, you know, really easy to follow the, the guidelines of which we follow as farmers. Very much a box ticking exercise. You know, I went and did the, did the, the ag ITO thing it was called back then. It was sort of an on farm. Um, extracurricular thing. It was actually part of me being able to leave school at the age I did um, because I wasn't legally allowed to leave. But as part of that, I had to go and study something outside of school. And so um, that came in that form. Um, and so I was, I was, 
you know, on paper, I'd been right through the the motions of of, of learning and, and and certification. I I had um, you know level one right through to production management of that that format of curriculum of learning, and and then you know so out there I was um, very competitive, and and trying to be you know the best at what I did. The the space was all about sort of trying to be better than everyone and. There wasn't a great sense of fulfillment there from all the years of chasing that 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 target of being the best and always improving and and you know actually just last night i was having a conversation with an old friend who's been pushing the production paradigm and and dairy farming here in new zealand for the last seven years and every year he's better and better and better and 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 then you sort of have kids through that and it, it just takes you away from life and when you're focused on production as the goal, regardless of the cost, you know, the, the monetary cost, the ecological cost, the cost on yourself, as far as um, what that actually requires from a human being is it really, you know, somehow, and I got stuck in it too, we just get caught in it and, and trying to chase that target of, of more and more and more and more. And we, it takes you away from living. And that's what I felt. And so in my years of doing that, I, I was with um, my ex-partner um, through that whole period um, and, you know, I just got more and more distant to to her, more and more distant to my own family and then I had my own family, had children and really I, through the whole time and it was just a blur, it was like I was never present because I was always thinking about the work to be done and not only that but I was always thinking that I needed to be doing more. So. You know, let's say, for instance, you know, in the dairy industry, it's very predictable. We can plan quite far ahead. You can you can get a series of tasks and tick them all off, and quite often I would. But then I'd get home after having done, you know, everything that I said I would go out and do, but it wasn't enough. And so the impact was I, um, you know, I, I spent probably 10 years where I didn't communicate very well with my family and... Uh, also, um, my I, I believe my health took a toll. Like I didn't sleep well. Um, I, I, I used to smoke marijuana in the evenings to make my mind stop because it literally just wouldn't stop, and and I wouldn't allow myself to stop. So it was, um, yeah, it was quite. But when you're in it, you know, like you don't notice that stuff. Like when you're in that paradigm, it's just the normal, you know. And that's why we have the rates of um, depression and suicide we have in the industry because it's just it's seen as the norm. And if you're not working hard, then it's like you're a bit less of a man or something. And so it wasn't until looking back upon it that I thought, wow, I did that for so long and didn't even know it was taking place. So it sounds like there were kind of multiple fronts of pressure applying. Um, I imagine from there's the financial pressure, there's maybe the farming community pressure. Um, is that the case? There's, it's kind of multiple areas or kind of multiple forces that are putting pressure on farmers to operate in a certain way that is creating all these problems. That's certainly a part of it. But for me, it was really, most of it was within myself. Like the, I, I sort of viewed it and it was in my family that um, if you weren't working, you know, really, really hard, then then yeah like i said you weren't you weren't a man or something like that and so um yes pressure's part of it but when i look back i i, I created all of that you know I, I made sure it was there um yes sure there's there's things within you know financial constraints within you know advisory roles of people that that give farmers advice and there's also the the jargon out there in the social circles you know the 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 camaraderie at the pub or the you know the rugby chats all about who's who's you know doing better it's um it's societal and but when you get down to it and because i've been able to look um back in my time in that space was was i was you know really i created it all you know i was responsible for it or i you know, in my case wasn't responsible for it but but you know i made a choice to take all that stuff on like like um like it was the only way, like I was born into that that context or into that, you know, occurring. Which must be a really common story. I mean, you must he hear the, your own story 
kind of spoken back to you a lot from the farmers that you're working with now. Like, what was the what was the transition for you? What was the catalyst for for change for you? What happened that you are in the position you are now? Yeah, so um, a couple of things, really, really odd set of circumstances. So yeah, through the whole time, I didn't know this was happening, right? And then, and then one day I was sort of, I had a discussion with my then wife about where we were going, how things weren't really working with when I was contracting and doing 110 hour weeks, although the financials were there. Um, you know, my wife was basically a solo mother at home. And so I made a conscious choice to look at leaving the industry, which what it looked like was I was going to be taking a job as a as a fertilizer dispatch man. So organizing 11 fertilizer trucks in around the Selwyn district. And that was going to be a step back from the running of I used to manage an aerial and ground spraying fertilizer application company at that point. And so I'd made a choice to that I knew I was I knew that I was doing too much work. But the contextual side of it was still oblivious to me but I knew I was working too much. And so made a choice to hand in my notice, get this other job. And I went as far as to sign a contract with these people. Um, and then six days before I was to start that job, I was just doing the last of my, you know, training of the people to take over my role as manager of the chemical company. Um, I was approached by a guy, uh, Tim Chamberlain. Um, I was actually at his farm doing an organic spraying job on some high standing fennel and, um, he came up to me and he, he said, he said, John, have you got five minutes to chat? And I said, sure. And I'd only met Tim twice before, um, very briefly. Um, and he said to me, he asked me what I'd done with my life as far as experience. And he'd heard that I was leaving the, the chemical company. And I told him about my career and, you know, <laughs> I was ever so proud of it. I was, you know, top 5% production for a few years um, with, with Fonterra and, I was really proud of that and, and none of which had anything to do with organics, which was what, um, which is how Tim operated. And, and he asked me to manage his farm and it was the, it was, it was the most profound thing. And I, I was just sort of struck with this decision, you know, six days prior to starting a job, another job, I was asked to take this job on and he got me a contract that night and it was a lot less than the money I was to be earning, but something just had me like, this is, this is, an opportunity and 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 I took it and and that really changed my whole what really changed my life so taking on that role as manager of Hearts Creek Farm which I was the first ever manager of that farm I'd been in the Chamberlain family for five coming up six generations and from there I went from being the local um, chemical guru to being an organic mixed cropping sheep and beef farmer and Tim you know, when he took me on, he was aware of this and, and I just got thrown in the deep end, which was just perfect. And so it was like I had to learn or, you know, I um, wasn't going to be able to fulfill my commitment as the as the manager of that farm. And so that brought on a whole lot of crazy different learning. You know, no longer did I have the chemical answers. No longer could I just look back through my history and come up with the solution in the form of a bottle. I actually had to think about my management and... A lot of things happened. I started to discover the power of, you know, plant diversity and ecosystem function, which as, you know, the farmer that I, you know, trained myself to be was, that was a completely uncharted territory. And then, um, so that was what started it. And then a year into that, you know, really the damage um, that had been done to my marriage through that whole period of, you know, 10 years, um, was done and so and so my wife and children left they moved away and it was just really abrupt just really sudden which was a, a blessing in disguise as much as we worked well together as a as a parenting um, partnership um you know we just didn't have much of a you know connection like when i look back at it like you know was that the sort of relationship that i would like my children to look up to as good and then no i couldn't say that that was so um at that moment, I was like, wow, you know, all my life I'd worked towards having the the farm and the lifestyle for my family. All of that was sort of, you know, gone. And so I I had to really think about what I was doing with my life, which <laughs> was, it was, you know, it was interesting. And um, it really took that moment of hardship and grief 
for me to really look back, you know, really closely at my life and what I had made it up to be. And all of a sudden I was faced with, do I continue this sort of trajectory I was heading in towards farm ownership? Or do I, you know, create something brand new, which through what I'd learnt um, and through the profound circumstances, it sort of gave me this perspective where I was able to inspire and teach others from having been through such a crazy transition and do so really effectively. So I was faced with this opportunity to, to you know, offer that to the world. And so I started a group um, which was just, it started as a farmer discussion group um, that I created just to share knowledge within local farmers who were doing cool stuff. And um, the group grew really quick and evidently it was something that that the community wanted but wasn't aware they could have. So it was like a ground up movement. It was farmers leading farmers. It was from the start created to just share knowledge and not in a righteous way like it's the truth but like just to share people's experiences and people can take from that whatever they like you know there was always the the foundation was there was no such thing as a silly question or comment in the group and that everyone's opinion was valid and it, it really blew up and um we named the group quorum sense and it sort of became very quickly um something quite big something that I then had to step away from as like the you know the helmsman because it very quickly generated its own trajectory and then sort of about three years into my management at Hearts Creek Farm while this was sort of developing the group and my skills and knowledge were developing into this thing we call regenerative agriculture um, I was faced with a choice of of being able to leave the farm and and facilitate the sixth generation succession of the farm family succession so I went ahead and did that and then and then started the the coaching company um, natural performance so um, literally committed my you know time to going out and teaching the stuff to farmers that potentially don't know it exists and and do so from a space of having been through the radical transition myself it's quite a massive journey you've been on really from being a, a so like could you give it i give a picture for people who don't know what a chemical applicator does like what what does that role look like yeah. to provide the contrast from where you are now to what that job entailed i had a team of guys with trucks and um we also had two helicopters where we went around um spraying fields um pastures um crops with chemicals to to kill things whether it be plants whether it be insects or whether it be fungus and bacteria it was literally uh, yeah a license to kill so in, in, in conventional farming we have um we have you know people have things that they're dealing with um they love monocultures which is where you just grow one species of plant and they love to control these 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 monocultures and um so when they'd have something come in like a weed or a pest that was identified by likes of a agronomist or a field technician i would then come in with the the chemicals to to kill whatever it was that they wanted to kill and that was yeah that's basically a chemical applicator so going around in trucks broad acre spraying and helicopters broad acre spraying and applying fertilizer to to farmlands you've really just completely changed like everything about how you um what the what you support in terms of how farming's done and the kind of food that you're going to eat and the kind of food you want to feed your family yeah yeah quite literally um you know back in the in, in my time in the conventional space you know i didn't really know any other way and so it was sort of normal um and then when i discovered that you didn't need all those chemicals and you didn't need all those fertilizers and that most of what we're dealing with as a society is based upon how we produce our food yeah yeah my, my thinking on food production dramatically shifted and that's why I'm so passionate about what I do because the ripple effects of food production are just monumental. What view of the world do you do you hold to to look at a piece of land and require a helicopter to spray it versus 
the view of the land that you're looking through now with a regenerative lens? Back in the conventional mindset, I would be looking for problems and they would appear in various forms. But it was like, ah, problem, we need to come in and fix that problem. Now it's a case of um, what I would have normally viewed as a problem. I look at like, okay, what's causing this and is it really a problem? So, for instance, in the conventional space, having a different species of plant growing near our desired crop is a problem. Um, and so you would then go and treat that problem. Now my view is, is it really a problem? No, it's not. And in fact, it actually will increase the resilience of what you're growing by having that diversity. And in fact, now I go ahead and plant more diversity with cash crops as, as a goal. And so... Um, you very quickly begin to take a step back and have a bit more of a of a systems view like instead of seeing things like um that you need to intervene with um we then take a step back and and, and ask the question why is that particular you know problem or what have you like let's 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 be specific so you've got for instance um a handful of aphids all right so in the old paradigm there's aphids there we wouldn't weigh up whether the aphids are doing any real damage as soon as you see aphids that's it you come in and spray them and so i wasn't aware that there was actually signals within nature and within natural ecosystems that signal for these pests to come so it's what it is is a plant that's not performing its role in the ecosystem will show up like a it's a different sense for insects. They can pick up plants that aren't performing well. When I say performing, plants that aren't photosynthesizing well enough, so turning the sunlight's energy into complex sugars and carbohydrates and feeding the biology in the soil. So what it looks like from an insect's perspective is the plant will be literally waving a red flag saying, come and eat me. Okay, and so you take away the insect and you've not addressed the cause, more insects will come every time. And I... It was like a license to print money. Once you started killing the, the, the indicator of the problem rather than fixing the problem, nature will just send more troops every time. And so with a regenerative mindset, we look at, okay, what is within this plant that's causing the signal for insects to come? Okay, well, it's, it's low bricks. This plant's not performing well. It's not getting enough complete you know, amino acids and, and complex compounds within itself so that it's resilient to the pests that are attacking it so you take you get to stay, take a step back and sort of you're not you're not reacting you're you're preventing there's a there's a um a story that we often come across um in researching regenerative ag i hear this quite often where um for example let's say you've got a regenerative ag farmer farming next to a conventional farmer and eventually the conventional farmer kind of pops over next door to find out what's what's happening that you know he's starting to see the difference and and let's say the regenerative ag farmer takes him off it takes him up to the border of the two farms with a spade and digs a hole on each side and the conventional farmer is completely blown away by how much life there is under this in the soil um, of the regenerative ag farmer and how little life there is in his own soil how's it come to pass that farmers don't that for conventional farmers are no longer kind of familiar with that whole community of life that's that's under the soil. Like, I feel like maybe once upon a time that was better well known or more well known, um, or maybe understood to some extent. But it's like that that it's like that knowledge is no longer there. Yeah, yeah. There's this great disconnect. And just for some context, I for all my years of farming never dug one hole. So uh, other than to, you know, perhaps fix a post I'd broken or something, but not to look at the soil as anything but a growing medium. So the way that we're brought up to farm is we all talk about soil as a resource, but we don't understand why. And we certainly don't understand um, the biological aspect of farming. So when you've, whether you've been through Lincoln or Telford or Massey, you know, even soil science degrees, there's very little discussion on biology. And so farmers just don't 
understand that that life's even there let alone do they understand what it what it could mean for them as far as their profitability and resilience and and it being a focal point they and so it's really exciting because you know i've seen farmers that have been dealing with issues on certain areas of their farm for generations and and their advice has been you know put on this fertilizer more of this fertilizer a bit more of this fertilizer and then and then i come along and show them like get them reconnected to their the the things that they can actually observe for themselves within the soil and very quickly you see light bulbs come on like wow you know we we've not you know we've not been showing this this is why these areas aren't performing and rather than stopping and looking at the soil they've just been and look you can't blame these guys either because this is just the 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 way in which we're brought up to farm the way in which we're taught to farm and so there's very little emphasis on soil and biology and farming and that's just the reality of it there's nothing to do with the farmers and when you get farmers reconnected to those senses it's like you know like when when you smell soil it's like you don't need to be taught what good soil smells like you know you guys can relate like you pick up a good bit of healthy soil and bury your face and it's like oh it's 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 like a it's like a sense that we're born with because literally our lives depend on it like quite literally it's like a it's like a shark's ability to sense blood in the ocean you know their lives depend on that we've got an ability to sense for healthy soil because our lives depend on it so when you get farmers reconnected to those basic fundamentals of food production it, it's like life-changing for them like you see like this child come out and all of a sudden they can't get enough of their spade it's their new favorite toy they've, they've given up the plowing but they're out there digging up more of the soil than they ever were with the plow <laughs> And what was that like for you? I imagine that you must have had a, a sense of kind of childlike wonder again when you were going through that process of, of learning the principles of regenerative ag and learning the soil. Um, how, how was that for you? It's like all of a sudden you become part of something. You're no longer the, 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 the master of puppets at the top, you know, controlling all the strings. You very quickly begin to understand that, oh, no, actually, I'm just part of this. And really, and getting out of the way and letting nature do her thing, most of the time, you know, she's always got a plan. I always say that she's always one step ahead. But it, it literally, <clears throat> it bought me, it, it took all the significance out of my life. Like that's, that's what it comes down to. Like it took, like when you become, when you realize that, that you're just part of an ecosystem as opposed to trying to control it, all this, all this sort of pressure lifted off my shoulders it sort of felt like and yes i i, I basically went back to being a four-year-old out there just just amazed by what you know what amazing things um you know natural ecosystems provide so what does that look like on the ground like you dig up a you put the spade in the ground on a conventional farm versus um a farm who's prax practicing regenerative ag what does that soil look like and what is above the soil that creates all that goodness in there? Okay, so um, with regard, and so, and I also want to be very careful of, of like the versus thing because I don't do too much of the versus thing. But, um, yeah. and, and, and really there's, there's people that have been doing, you know, cool stuff for a long time and, and possibly not had the results. Like there's, there's so many different contexts. But basically in the soil, what we're looking for is, is essentially first we're looking at soil porosity so um what's the soil's ability to house microbes like and so said more specifically um porosity is the spaces of air between soil aggregates in the soil so so literally like the home for your microbes to live in you know like us as humans we can live a long time without food and we can live a you know a little bit less without water but without oxygen we don't last too long and it's the same with a lot of microbes in the soil certainly a lot of the beneficial ones so um i'm digging looking at porosity in the soil i'm also looking at the the color and carbon content within the soil or the humus content so we want to see nice black topsoil you know black is the carbon black is the humus and so um looking at the color looking at and, and digging your digging your face into it and, and having a smell so lovely um active um full of life soil has an unmistakable smell and so as long as there's 
good porosity in the soil as long as you've got a diversity of um, root architectures and, and when I say root architectures, different structures of roots within the soil and that you've got a farm system that allows plants to fully complete their carbon cycle. So what that is, is back to the, the photosynthesis, so plants turning sunlight um, energy into into basically into sugar or, or complex carbohydrates of which the plant pumps um, out through its roots to feed the biology and build and store um, in the form of stable carbons and glomalin and things in the soil. So um, a, a lifeless soil might look pale, um, it might look compacted, so no porosity, um, a really neutral smell, so, so poor soil doesn't have a smell to it. And even you go the other end of the spectrum, anaerobic soil um, with with water logging and demineralizing taking place actually smells a bit pooey. So not only does it perform poorly, it actually smells really yucky. Um, so we're not we're not when when we're looking at the the soil, it's it's a smell, it's an observation with your sight, even getting in there and feeling the texture of the soil. So has it got a nice crumb structure? Does it fall apart in my hands? Um, yeah, basic, basic observational skills. That's what it, that's what it looks like. Yeah. I just wanted to follow up one thing you, you started that answer with was, um, you don't like this kind of versus attitude between conventional and regenerative. And I totally agree with that. And I think there's, there can be a lot of blame put on farmers, especially from, uh, environmental groups and activists who are, um, I guess kind of outraged at some of the damage that they're seeing um, in the environment and uh, pointing the finger at the farmers as as the problem. And I think that can be a really dangerous place to be of pointing the finger and creating this kind of us versus them war between the you know the the public and and farmers when that's not going to get anything solved. And I think a better approach is understanding yes there are problems but those farmers are they're farming in a way that they've they've been brought up in and they're operating within a system that has flaws as well and that by pointing the finger and creating blame it's not going to create those solutions that we need yeah no you you did right jordan and so um you've got to remember that that everyone's actions like everyone's farming operations like literally correlate the way that things occur to them so everything that you know people that are farming conventionally are doing is justified and there's even there's even stacks of data that validate what people are doing and so their actions are perfectly suited to their their view of the way things are and that's just that and when we get stuck in us versus them and blame and then we get defensive there's no progression in that you know when people are holding on to their stance and defending their stance because they're feeling like other people are judging or or making them wrong for what they're doing there's no freedom to explore there's no desire to explore and there's no learning and it's just really yucky like it's it becomes this this who's right who's better discussion, and so I I don't like to have this, you know. And really, when people use the word regenerative agriculture, like it's a thing, like it's it's not it's not a thing, it's not something that oh yeah no I'm regenerative today, it's not that's not it's it's a context from which to operate. So, um, you, and and I'm glad we brought this up because we we won't move forward. If there's righteousness and that's why the group quorum sense is so effective because there's so many ways that we can be farming and, and we're innovating all the time and to innovate you have to be able to let go of what you're currently doing and if you're stuck in defense mode there's no letting go you know like when someone's when someone's putting you know physical pressure on you like to let go is like you know absurd you just wouldn't do it and so what it takes is for people to stop judging for people to stop pointing the finger like people aren't you know doing the best that they can it's just really shifting and, and bringing rather than a you need to do this this way it's more to me how we operate and, and and what how we progress is like well this is 
this is what I've discovered and this is what I'm doing. Um, and, and, and just sharing that, like, like, you know, I don't believe there should be such a thing as, as IP. Like if we're all just sharing our experiences and not from a righteous way, people then get to pick from that, whatever they like. And it's, it's, it's then a case of they do that because they want to rather than because they're being told to or are feeling forced to. That's why I don't like the regulation approach or the top down approach because feeling like you have to do something, you know, call me stubborn, but it just doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. there's an, a real need to create space. I mean, creativity and, um, you know, the, the space to evolve comes from um, being in a, in a positive space, being, b being able to think outside the box and being able to question the way that you've done things all of your life and if you're holed into um, a corner and being accused of doing things wrong then you're not going to be thinking in a way that really opens you up to to evolving as a, a farmer and as a person and, and as a member of society so it's a yeah we need to we need to create that positive space and and and, and hold that huge respect that um, that farmers deserve because they're the farmers growers um, dairy farmers, crop farmers, who, all kinds of farmers, they're producing the food that we eat. Um, that beautiful, healthy soil that you're talking about is critical. It's now become, you know, um, we're now much more aware of how uh, the connection between that really healthy soil and the microbi the gut microbiome of the human being and the, the relation between those two things, how connected they are, um, which is something that I find um, really interesting and I think you've spoken quite a lot about that as well like the the connection between the two and how important it is that that um, farmers are growing in really healthy soil could you talk a little bit about that yeah and and it, it really it does all come back to the soil 100% you know um, humus the word humus is and and the word human you know like literally we come from the soil and so um, in the soil you know and and, and good healthy soil if you were to dig up a teaspoon of healthy soil and put it under the microscope, you'll find there's actually more microorganisms in that teaspoon uh, of soil than there are human beings on this planet. And so um, quite profound. And so the a lot of microbes in the soil are actually harvested by plants. Plants will actually um, take in microbes from the soil and actually, we call it farming microbes. Fa um, plants will actually farm microbes for them to have um, specific roles carried out within the plant and then when animals come and eat that plant you know they they then are basically inoculated themselves with with biology that comes from the soil and then and then um, when you get a so in the soil um, and why I, I love um, diversity and we're now seeing the, the profound shift in, in performance based on diversity is because when you get a a diversity of microbes in the soil such that um, and, and when I'm referring to microbes, so they're microscopic little bugs in the soil. For those that haven't got an introduction or a background in biology, they're, they're, there's millions of, 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 of teams and colonies of microbes performing different roles, you know, but like human beings, we all have different strengths and weaknesses. And when you become part of a, a wider group and you can all be focused on a common goal, you can all focus on what you do best and support each other and where others aren't so, you know, prevalent. And so in, in the soil, there's millions of, of microbes all working together and and symbiosis to to feed plants and support plants in their growth so that they can then in return feed them and 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 feed the the biology um it's like a currency so in the soil that the, the payment for the services of the biology is carbon that carbon is exuded out through the plant's roots the the microbes come along and feed on that carbon in return for minerals in the soil so it's the biology that are performing the role in the soil of providing minerals to the plant okay and the more that biology does that to the plant the more nutrient dense the plant's going to be and so when you've got bustling diversity of biology in the soil you've you've then got um plants that are fully sufficient in all their minerals and a and a dense in nutrition so that when animals come along and feed on that plant or might be vegetable production when when animals and humans feed on that plant it's then basically taking that biology and inoculating their stomachs with it. And if not directly inoculating, if not actually eating whole microbes, the food that then is introduced to the, 
stomach, which is another, you know, microbiome in itself, attracts a diversity of biology, again, doing that same role in the gut. So more biology, more diversity of biology, performing symbiotic relationships with each other, um, all providing minerals to that to that human or that that animal. Um, and again, the more diversity, the better. So um, we're, we're now becoming aware of this phenomenon called quorum sensing, which is um, which is it's basically what happens in the soil is when you get a level of microbial diversity in the soil, um, and they're all working symbiotically um, with each other for the for the greater good. Is things start to happen in the soil that we've never seen before, and um, it's happening in, in human health as well. So when humans get a level of um, of microbial diversity in their stomachs. Um, this quorum sensing takes place and what happens is molecules start to fire and genes start to express that have never happened before or perhaps have never um, never expressed before in the human and so we get this resilience that comes with that diversity and people start to have like historic health concerns and ailments disappear like it's crazy and and they're now playing around with with fecal transplants and things to inoculate people's guts with with more diverse biology for that very reason because when you get that diversity of biology present whether it be in the soil or in the human gut or in an animal's gut that that the person whose you know gut we're referring to whether it be an animal or a, or a human is is more efficient it's more resilient and it requires less inputs but can produce more outputs put it simply and so it's all comes back to the soil and just to give you some context like uh, there's there's some studies done that at the moment as a as a as a species human beings are expressing about eight percent of their total gene pool with the current diet and the current lifestyle and it's not all about diet you know there's various other things that will affect your gene expression but if you can increase your your um, intake of, of different foods to uh, more than 30 plus different plant foods per week. There's studies showing that you'll literally have more genes expressed as a result of that diversity being introduced, but it must be, you know, whole foods. It must be real food. Mm, which is really interesting to think about in the period of pandemic that we're in now, um, the, the extent to which we would really be um, suffering as much as if we were all much healthier from from eating um healthier food less yeah if we had a more resilient uh body and immune system to to fight threats like the coronavirus coronavirus. and things like that Mm. yeah yeah and like i see it in 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 stock health so um animal health a bit like human health is one of those trends that don't seem to buck it's always increasing um and but what we're seeing now through introducing um, plant diversity to an animal's diet and giving it that ability to select what it's requiring in the form of different plants is I've seen a rapid decrease in, in parasitic burden. So like worm burden and sheep especially. So when you've got the animal's stomach functioning and this resilience starts to take place, um, we can have like for instance we'll stick to the to the worms and, and lambs is um we can have fecal egg counts that are quite high in in, in fecal egg counts so eggs of 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 um parasitic um you know insects within the the animal's um stomach but yet the animal is completely unaffected like said more directly animals can be eating parasites and the parasites won't touch the animal the animal's got this gut, resi- this resilience, and it all comes from the gut. And we're seeing crazy things happening with humans as well. Like, it's it's crazy to consider, and and why it gets, you know, it, it's always really tricky to try and talk about the magnitude of what's possible when we talk about the impacts of soil health on human health. You know, I can get lost in a tangent for a couple of hours with you guys talking about that, but um, but basically, if you can stop and it's the same as in when i deal with farmers stop doing the damaging things so remove the the damaging inputs or or management practices and in humans it's maybe things within our diet remove the 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 negative the 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 negative impacting you know parts of our of our system so with farmers you know looking at what are the things that are damaging our biology and our soil you know cultivation high analysis fertilizer use all these things let's stop doing the damaging things and then, and then outside of that, how do we 
increase our diversity so how do we increase more food into the system that's going to attract more biology that's then going to increase our resilience so it's it's um it's no different to humans so stop doing the damaging things so antibiotics you know um although the, i'm sure there's a place for them but you know I, I think that 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 whole realm of of killing biology has been been too easily leaned on um but then looking at you know how do we increase our our, our food diversity how do we increase the, the diversity of food that we're ingesting how do we you know shift our mindset so that we're not you know negatively bringing on you know susceptibility and 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 lowering our you know literally our um our, our cell integrity and our, our gene expression when i hear all these like amazing uh stories that you share around what you've experienced with regenerative ag regenerative ag i can't <laughs> tricky word for me um regen ag um it amazes me how it's like why isn't everybody doing this um it, it just kind of it makes so much sense um and it does feel like there's a movement growing and there's a lot of interest from both farmers and non-farmers in a more regenerative model what are some of the barriers to farming in this way um what, what are some of those barriers that exist okay so to me what it is is it comes back to people's lack of understanding so um i mean you did right it's like you can be forgiven for wondering why aren't more people doing this um and and there's things that mainly it's around their understanding so people if they don't understand something you know you can't blame them for not wanting to go and invest in that thing when i say invest i mean their time you know apply their attention to and so um a lot of people are used to having data and 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 so that then then certain things are justified and people like to do all their research before they go into something you know long gone are the days of people trusting their gut instinct um and so so a lot of what's missing is not only people's understanding but people's sort of willingness to let go so a lot of the way people operate now as food producers will be contradicted by their learnings of ecological function and, and biology and and you know the regenerative agriculture principles a lot of it um is going to be you know it, it requires some some vulnerability and and some willingness because you're going to have to let go of some stuff and until we get all the relevant data to, to showcase what we're doing and it's coming and there is a lot there already but i believe once we get that data and we do a few more case studies which which i'm taking um part in, in creating now is um once there's that it's it's beyond a cool idea then you know like it's beyond like something that people think is maybe just a feel good thing because you meet regenerative farmers and they're all you know they're all really happy and they're all really vibrant and it's all really cool and exciting and so you would think it would be you know senseless not to to go and ask a few questions but it's um i think in my experience what's missing is that is that you know scientific data and a lot of what we're observing actually is going to be quite tricky to to you know analyze and 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 put into a into a a set of data that's you know people are used to seeing which is very linear you know in, in in ecosystem function there's not much that's linear it's no longer a case of here's a problem here's the solution or one plus one is two sort of in the space of of broader ecological function it's it's there's always multiple things at play so the key one is understanding and that's why i'm so passionate about educating so when people get it you know then they actually want to learn then they actually want to inquire mm. and the the social impact as well like going against the grain like going against what everybody else is doing yeah yeah i mean there was a time where you know when i took on the management role at hearts creek farm where i had friends who i'd been friends with for a long time sort of like oh jono's bloody gone a bit weird you know john we and and my old man and he's he's coming around he's, he's he won't say this anymore but he used to say you know, for for those of you that don't know, he's a he's a he's still a chemical applicator. That's been my background. Um, and and when I when I first took on Hearts Creek Farm, he's like, "Oh, where's your where's your flex jandals?" <laughs> he thought it was a great joke, you know. And so, at at the beginning, there's certainly a a feeling of 
you know, like you're the odd one. But I guess for me, once I started to get, you know, Quorum Sense the group up and running, and when I got out there in the community, actually I realised there's a whole, you know, as much as I dislike this, this separation, but once you get a group around you of people that are interested in supporting each other and forward progression and innovation, um, it's just so infectious. And, and the way it's impacted my whole life is like, I can't comprehend, you know, like my, my, my watch tells me my heart rate's dropped 15 to 20 beats per minute on average. I don't need to smoke cannabis to sleep. I'm just so content. I can be present with people because I'm not so stressed thinking about the way I'm farming and, and, Look, it rolls out into the community like you get kids involved in growing food and, and teach them some of the principles that are at play. They're just like, wow. And because they don't have any of that, you know, stuff going on in the background, which is what we've got to deal with as, you know, as as farmers, that they're just on. You know, it's, it just seems like the most obvious choice. And, and it's so it's so amazingly cool that, you know, they want to learn more. So I think. If you can get back to that space of discovery and wonder and, and then you can start to see all this cool stuff you know that's yeah you can't put a you can't put a price on that and to see farmers going back to and this is what gives me the biggest kick seeing farmers go back to literally acting like little boys like i've got people that i'm out there with you know in their 60s and 70s and they're just they're just just so fascinated by all the life that's in their in their farming system that they were never aware of and, and you've said that um, if kind of life outside the farm has been improving for farmers as well. Yeah. And for me, you know, and I can only speak of my own experience. Um, once I really, once I really owned what I was doing to the point where others wouldn't dare question me because they know, like, one, I don't defend myself. It's just what I'm doing. I don't get caught up in justifying what I'm doing. And so, and nor do I get wrapped up in people's view of me like you know i'm an interesting looking character and if you were to judge me i mean you can be forgiven for thinking i'm a bit strange and the moment that i was okay with being a bit different you know all the fear disappeared of judgment i didn't worry what people thought of me and when you don't worry what people think of you and you're passionate about something people don't not only do people stop sort of you know trying to dig at you most of the guys that used to dig at me are now coming along to my events. You know, they want to learn more because they're like, man, he's really, you know, passionate about what he does. And, and you know, it's sort of quite infectious out there. And then you see that ripple effect of like, and because you're teaching people, it's, you know, it goes back to the, you know, teach a man to, to, to fish. You can, you know, go and feed his family. You teach a farmer how to operate utilizing natural principles. It's like watching a great movie. You can't help but go and tell your friends about it. And then all of a sudden, there's this great big ripple effect and it goes into the schools. And I'm now speaking at schools and universities and and it's it's profound. And to teach that sort of, to teach that, it's not just responsibility, but bringing a sense of leadership to what people are doing. So really owning what they're up to such that they actually then lead others to learn and discover as well. And like all of a sudden people aren't holding on to their information. It's like, oh, here's what I'm doing. And it's just, you know, take it. Want to want to want to share it. Mm. What are what are some of the impacts that you're, you're seeing, like in terms of how the farms have been affected, but um, fr from the farmers you're working with, like, yeah, what are what are some of those stories that you're seeing in person? Oh man, so you know, farmers becoming suddenly aware that they haven't needed to spend all that money on fertilizer, that's a big one. Um, seeing farmers um the cool thing the cool thing for me is is you know, it's one thing to teach farmers something and even then they're like, wow, you know, but to have them observe those shifts on their own farm. Like for instance, farmers that have never had worms on their property discovering they can have worms. You know, like I've got a, got a guy and I just recently interviewed him for, for a wee podcast series that I'm doing. And he talks about the moment we, we found our first worm together. And it was like life changing for him. You know, it, it changed his life. And, and seeing farmers, you know, 
growing crazy cover crops and and oh look like farmers realizing that they don't need to destock to 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 grow more grass they can carry more stock and be more profitable and grow more grass as a result while not having any inputs is like people I've, I've seen people be reduced to tears when they have that moment i've seen i've had farmers say to me in their 60s they've been waiting their whole life for something like this it's you can't put you know you can't yeah. that's something i never expected to be a part of you know i never expected people's impact to be so broad in their lives it must be quite a amazing thing to be able to provide that for people to kind of help them along on that journey it's you know if i was to try and predict this you know three years ago there was no way i could have predicted that i'd be out doing what i'm doing you know i've just been winging it the whole time and and to be able to have that impact i mean I, there's a reason i don't need drugs to sleep anymore i'm just I'm so content and it's like you cannot put a monetary value on that uh, nor have I ever cried so much in the space of three years you know both happy and and sad but you know there's not very many times and you guys will agree that I'm speechless there's not very very many times and 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 these moments just just have me speechless I just yeah there's a really um beautiful moment that you experienced when you that you've told us about before and I wonder if you'd mind sharing the story about a farmer that you're working with um who had a bit of an epiphany when he went to not on the farm but when he went to, went to pick up his daughter from school one time do you remember telling us that story yeah I do so this is actually my very first ever client and Marcus won't mind me sharing this but um when he started to discover that he was part of the eco ecosystem that is his farm and through my sharing and and this is the thing like you've got to share what you're up to it's such a big part of it all is, is the sharing and not only the stuff that i'm doing on farms but within my life and so through my sharing with this client of mine and through his shifting in perspective on life he found himself more engaged with his children and being able to really listen and through my sharing of my experience as a father as well um this fella um mark he was he felt himself um doing more with his family and so he went and picked up his daughters uh, his children from school and um it was the first time ever he had never picked up his kids from school i think that seven and eleven years old at the time i think his um, daughter was seven and his son was eleven yeah, forgive me if I've got those wrong, Marcus. But anyway, um, Mark went and picked up his kids from school. And they were sort of like, what? Dad's here, you know? And and his daughter had netball. And so um, his daughter wanted to bring a friend so that they could go to netball together. And he said, no, that's cool. And they got to netball. And um, he found himself observing, um, you know, all the, all the mothers doing their catch-ups and the kids playing their, their netball. And they were actually a, a player down. And, and Mark, not only going and picking the kids up from school and then going to netball, he actually found himself um, actually found himself out there engaging with the with the team and with the with the students. And they got back in the car, and his daughter was talking to a friend and was like, "It's like Dad's got new ears." You know, they weren't they weren't wanting their father to hear that, but he heard it, and and I know it made a big difference for him. But literally, when we talk about bringing that connection back. It's bringing people's connection back to their families. It's bringing people's connection back to one another. You know, no longer are we separate from anyone or anything. And when people when when people are getting that and applying it out there into their into their families, like, yeah, it's um, you know, we weren't expecting that. Have you noticed changes outside of farming in your own life? How you're maybe viewing the world or how you're um yeah operating outside of work yeah so um 100 so in my caught up you know nature and, and farming historically and and in righteousness and 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 you know i always had to be right and i always knew better um i didn't learn a hell of a lot and um i was very much you know disconnected to people my family lots of people and and through this whole journey you know reconnecting with people reconnecting with my family 
and my children like my goodness the things that i overlooked in my children when i was caught up in the in the conventional mindset when i realized that you know they are just the way they are and they're just perfect just the way they are you know like a bit like um the way in which nature operates is um i began to start seeing things in my children that i'd never noticed before you know my ex-wife bless her would say to me i wish you'd listen like this when we were together <laughs> you know i started to be able to listen and um it's it's the the relationship i have with my children and like right now i'm outside my mother's house that wasn't predictable i hadn't didn't have much of a relationship with either of my parents it's like i, I got reconnected to all of my family um i got over the desire of being this tough guy i got over wanting to be right all the time and i got over the fear of people judging me for being anything other than the stereotypical male so i started telling loved ones that i loved them and i started communicating things with people that i hadn't communicated with before and you know my grandfather right now is is in hospital and he's got leukemia and things aren't looking flash there is nothing that i haven't said to my grandfather because i got over the fear of judgment through this whole process um and and look we've had some really amazing moments of connection that that if i hadn't have taken this journey on i would have never have had and so I get to be with people for the first time in my whole life. And it's really cool. Talking to you always makes me emotional. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got a tissue? Yeah, where's the tissue? So, so like, I always, like, and one of the things I love about talking to you is that I always, your passion is always so present, but also um, your optimism. Mm. So I'm really keen to like, yeah. I mean, it's 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 so refreshing to to hear optimism, especially in the space that we're that we're in and all the research that we're doing, which doesn't imbue us with a lot of optimism. So I love talking to you for that reason. And yeah, I'm just wondering, like, what's your what does the future look like to you? Oh man, what does the future look like to me? It's it's connected. There's no more us and them. Um, I see a a shift in what we view success to be. I see people more in tune with um, growing food and the power of growing food. Um, I see health and prosperity, and I see I see love like possibly that that people don't know exists, like complete acceptance of every human being. Like, what would that look like? There wouldn't be these discussions of what's the right thing to do what's you know whose side am i on you know we're all human beings and we're not separate to any other species nor are we separate from each other so there'd be no division within the human race but there'd also be no division of the ecosystem sure there's things that we do that uh, that other species can't but uh, the future to me looks looks diverse it looks abundant it looks colorful it looks joyous it looks sexy yeah healthy adventurous and fun yeah i'm coming with you that's the future i'm living into yeah 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 yep. and i think it's something that we can all kind of play our part in even if we're not farmers we can all kind of contribute to creating a future like that yeah um and just in just the way we operate and definitely by supporting farmers who are mm. who are making this transition or who are perhaps heading towards making this transition yeah mm. yeah yep. and i'm also talking with the farmers like there can't be any more you know us versus them as far as people's view on you know city folk you know like and there's core cool initiatives out there that are getting urban people back out into the farming community like i guess you know if i was to be as bold as to say you know one day there'll be no divide and and maybe one day we can look at being a bit more spread out, you know. I, yeah, there's so many logistic issues at the moment just based on, you know, condensed um, communities that brings its own set of challenges, you know. Perhaps one day there won't be that, that great division. Mm. 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 Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Jono, for awesome chat as always. Yeah, sharing your experiences <laughs> and your beautiful stories. We always yeah. love talking to you, and I'm sure we could talk to you for many more hours. So we might have to have you back on for a future podcast. Yeah, and one day a film. And one day a film. Yeah, there's yep. definitely yeah. a film coming. When we can actually when we can leave see the each other in person, <laughs> there'll be a film. Yeah, and we've got a bit more than a than a 4G network connection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The camera quality will be a bit higher. <laughs> yeah. Could Don't you see Barney? Actually... That's yeah. the most important thing. You could? Yeah. <laughs> I love the set decoration. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool, cool. Cool. Thanks so much, Jono. Right. Thanks, Jono. Right, thanks, guys. Barney. See ya. <laughs> see ya. <laughs> Thanks for tuning into this episode. If you'd like to support the show, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash happenfilms. See you in the next episode.